Hello and welcome to the Stratford Literary Festival Goes Virtual and in particular to this conversation. Thank you so much for being here and for supporting the festival in this way. My name is Julia Wheeler and it's my huge pleasure to welcome the author of this book. The book is The Threads of Life, A History of the World Through the Eye of a Needle uh, and the author is Claire Hunter. Claire, welcome to the virtual festival. Um, tell us, where are you? How's lockdown going? And are you sewing? <laughs> well, uh, uh, yes to sewing. Uh, I'm in a little glen in Scotland, uh, where, oddly enough, of course, one is used to being socially isolated uh, because it is very remote. And so in that strange way, life, you know, while we're here, hasn't changed that much for us. We're used to getting in stores of food because we get snowed out and sometimes flooded out. So we're used to uh, already being prepared for such an event, but not, of course, for sort of such sort of events as these at the moment. So we're trying to keep our spirits up, but the weather has been fantastic here the last three weeks, which has, has rained all winter. So that has helped with our spirits. And how about the sewing? I think you have been doing something COVID related. Oh, I have actually, yes. Um, in the Glen, as, a, as, as someone who used to be a nurse, got a whole gang of us working on what are called bags of banks. And uh, these are, are kind of like very large toilet bags, really, for nurses and others in the NHS staff to put their uniforms on in, into when they come off shift. So they can then take the bag and put their clothes inside the bag straight into the washing machine without having to risk further contamination. So I've been making ones with appliqued gold stars and then written on it says Eurostar. So those were delivered last week. So the, the sewing machine was whirring away in a way that I didn't think it would be doing. Let's let's talk about your, your sewing before we come on to the the um uh the, the sort of the, the content and the historical sort of social history of the book. Tell us how did you first have a find a love? Or sewing and embroidery and, and so on? Well I think as with many people uh, I learned to sew from being taught by my mother. Uh, I think really because I was quite an energetic and inquisitive child and she already had three others older than me and, uh, and she, felt, she felt that sewing would be a way of keeping me quiet and keeping me docile uh, because she didn't introduce me to kind of ordinary sewing she introduced me to embroidery and took me to a shop in Glasgow, which allowed me to choose from a kind of huge carousel of, you know, incredible colours, you know, all, all the threads that I wanted, and then bought me little cloths that were stamped with designs and taught me how to embroider. And actually, I just loved it. And it did its job. It did keep me calm. It did keep me quieter. And it did keep me asking less questions. You paint some beautiful pictures in your book of historical events um, and then plenty from your own lifetime and one of the ones that stands out for me um, is you at 17 in the dry cleaners. Ah uh, yeah. Tell us about that group of women because I just get the impression that actually they stayed with you for a lot of your life. They did. This is the thing when you're a student and I went to get a summer job and found one in the dry cleaners in Glasgow and at the end of our kind of washing and drying shift We'd all be gathered around a table uh, because we did a kind of um, special service which was more expensive. And for that service, people had their buttons sewn on again or, or uh, hems that had come apart, realigned, etc. And so we would sit around this big table and do all that mending. And as a student, I was given the task of sewing on buttons. And as I sat there and the woman realized I was only 17, they were very, very keen to kind of induct me into what lay ahead for me, a young girl you know, into the idea of, of kind of you know, basically terrible relationships, appalling sex, um, you know, a life of care of elderly and of looking after children. And of course, I'd never laughed as much in my life as I did during those sessions. Um, and when I eventually left, we then, I was going to holiday, they said, bring in all your holiday clothes to us and we'll wash them. But they didn't just wash them, they wrapped them up in cellophane, put them in cards and made them as posh as they could possibly make them as a kind of leaving gift to me to go out into my world, which is going to be very different from theirs. And I've always had a kind of, whenever I, I kind of smell that waft of dry cleaning vapour in the air, I get real nostalgia for that group of ribald but very, very warm hearted human. And you've recreated some of that in your own lifetime. Tell us about um, 
some of the groups of women and men actually that you Ooh. worked with to create some of that similar community, if you like? Yes, in the 1980s, I decided that I would actually take up sewing as a way to do community arts. I was working in community arts, using different art forms of communities. And I thought actually sewing is a fantastic medium to bring people together, people of different backgrounds, people of different skills, bring them together in local settings and create with the large pieces of public work that could tell others of their lives, their concerns, their achievements, their histories, because often the communities I was working with were those that were most marginalised, either because they were institutionalised in hospitals or in a, a, a mental home, or, or indeed ones that, because of poverty, were in, in a sense outside of active public life. And I wanted to bring them and their skills more into the public view. And so I set up a company called Needleworks and worked with all sorts of fantastic uh, communities in all sorts of different settings, shopping malls, museums, uh, local community centres, um, and never actually managed to work in a pub, but maybe one day. And um, and and we made these wonderful, they made with my help, these wonderful pieces of work, which then people could see and understand more about what it is they had to offer and what were the things that they cared about. And yes, and to give them a, a sense of a value, sometimes a place actually. I mean, if you if you um, use the example of Leith, maybe that was something which yes. was really powerful for those for those people involved. Yes, Leith is a neighbourhood in Edinburgh, not far from Edinburgh Castle, not far from the centre, but a very, very impoverished community. And um, when I did a project with them in the late 80s, it was very much suffering from uh, very poor housing, low job opportunities for the young, and a kind of um, image of themselves that was becoming um, uh, darker, in a sense, in terms of what the future might hold. And so a community worker there asked me to create a thing called Pictures of Leith, which turned out to be a 30 foot long panel, which involved all sorts of individuals and local groups uh, with images of their lives past and present. So it might have somebody's wedding day, it might have the, the girls that worked in the chemists, uh, it might have the bin men came in to make their one. So it was a kind of wonderful eclectic range of just uh, tactile and textile images of people's lives. And at the time, it really helped to bolster both the sense of community, but also a sense of the, the whole kind of richness of life that still lay within what seemed like a much more impoverished community. We think perhaps of uh, sewing and embroidery as a very docile activity. It's quiet, it's private, and we sit there, and, and often it's women's work. It's now perceived as women's work. But actually, there are some great examples in your book of how it can become political and I'm thinking of the miners perhaps and the miners banner and also a green common. Yes I mean in, in, for green and common when people and the women uh, created the peace camp at green common um, basically to protest about the um, location of nuclear, nuclear weapons then they then used textiles and banners as a way of making large visual proclamation about what it was mattered to them and they did it very cleverly because they did it using household textiles, sheets from home, worn out children's clothing, tea towels, in order to emphasize the fact that they were women, mothers, carers, families who cared about the world that they lived in and wanted to protect the future. And by using those kinds of textiles, as they, they gave that some more emphasis than it would have been done. And the suffragettes, in a very different way, when they were protesting, they actually used the fabrics from the drawing room, the silks, velvets, and, and um, damasks, to take those out onto the street, as opposed to be in the drawing room in a very uh, demure and beautiful fashion, and use them as a form of their material protest. But sadly, a lot of those don't survive, do they? And there again are political reasons, you know, sexual political reasons for that, is, is one of the. Um, um, the arguments that you make in the book. Yes, unfortunately uh, there are more that, that survive in England, but in Scotland many of the hundreds and hundreds of suffragettes embroidered in the placate banners haven't survived. And that was really because in museum terms, curators generally then, in those days, male curators, didn't see it with any social significance. 
in that work. It was, as you say, just women's work, just three. You worked with uh, miners in the, it would be the early 80s, I think, in terms of creating a, a banner and also um, a sense of identity. Yes, during the miners' strike in 1984, then strike, I was asked to come to Mansfield in Nottinghamshire um, to help work with the community, really, making banners for the May Day Parade. But because it was 1984, of course, it was the kind of um, summit of the miners' protest, the miners' strike. And a lot of the striking miners in Nottinghamshire didn't have um, their own banners. And so voluntarily, I started making them new ones with them, uh, which again were there to boost their efforts to, be, to have their um, demands noticed in terms of keeping those pits open. Let's go right back in history now, and um, one of the, the characters, if you like, or one of the, the figures that jumps out for some sort of connection with now is Mary, Queen of Scots, because she did an awful lot of sewing when she was in isolation, didn't she? She did. Mary, Queen of Scots, that's a fact. I'm completely at the moment engrossed in Mary, Queen of Scots, and she's keeping my spirits going during this time, uh, because that's what my next book is going to be about because when I started researching her for Threads of Life, I just found her story and the story of textile completely fascinating. And then was amazed to discover that, you know, there are all the uh, treasures accounts in Scotland of all the materials and threads and fabrics that she purchased during her time as Queen here, um, and also all sorts of inventories to show what it was she was wearing, what it was she was hanging in palaces, and then ultimately in, in captivity, what it was she was sewing. And because when she was in captivity in England, which she was for 18 years, then um, much of what she was trying to write was either intercepted or censored. Then she didn't have her own voice. And so she turned to you know, work that she had done in, in her youth and during part of her time in Scotland, but not to the same extent. And in captivity, she took it up with a vengeance and used it as an alternative form of communication, both with her supporters, but also with the next generation, with her son, James I of Scotland and Sixth of England, from whom she was estranged when she had to, you know, basically um, was forced to uh, abdicate from the throne. And so she made him sadly no longer existing, but described an incredible set of bed hangings, which are composed of small pieces of embroidery which in both in pictorial terms, but also in emblematic, kind of more complex language, sets out her feelings as a prisoner, her feelings about her relationship with Elizabeth, and also the dynastic family which she belonged to in all its glory. It's links to France, it's links to Spain, it's links to England, and of course it's links to Scotland. So in a way it was her demonstrating really her, the, the power that came from that she was she was demonstrating that through her um through her sewing she also used some fantastic metaphors it, sorry say that again julia I, she, I was just saying that she she used that as a way to demonstrate power and scotland's power and what yes. came through her but also she used some wonderful metaphors i'm thinking of the the, the ginger cat that's right no no she was quite mischievous in in, in what she sewed um, so there's a wonderful one which is in Holyrood House Palace in Scotland, in Edinburgh, uh, which is of a ginger cat uh, with a tiny little mouse scurrying beside it. And you would think, oh, that's just a little pretty image taken from an emblem book. But actually, of course, the cat is ginger in order to stand for Elizabeth I. And the little mouse which he inserted, which was not part of the original illustration that she took, was inspired by, is Mary herself. Uh, and there's another one that she made, which was a cushion for the Duke of Norfolk. And she in Norfolk, uh, who was the most powerful man in Britain at the time, uh, had plotted to marry over for Elizabeth and return Scotland and England to Catholicism. And so she made him a cushion which had a hand descending from the clouds of heaven and it's scything away the infertile vines, which are of course Elizabeth again, who was the Virgin Queen, to allow the younger, more fecund shoots of the young vine, which is Mary herself, to flourish. And into that cushion she's thrown other kind of um, treacherous uh, codes for the Catholic and Protestant religion, for escape and freedom, various things. 
to. It was intercepted and used in the, in, in the Duke of Norfolk's trial, and he was executed. Wow, so sowing as evidence. Yes, absolutely. You get a real sense, a real sense of actually she had plenty of a bit like us, she had plenty of time <laughs> to think these things through and to, to work them in. She had plenty of time, yes. Mm. And so for us in, in this part of the world, the Faber Tapestry is perhaps the most famous um, example of a story being um, created and told and handed down. Um, you went to see the tapestry, didn't you, as part of the research for the book? I did go and see it. It was, and it was a story that I hadn't seen it before, given a, you know, practically a lifetime you know, involved in needlework. Uh, and obviously I'd seen lots of pictures of it, but I had not prepared myself for actually the kind of sense of its presence when you actually went to see it, because it is an extraordinary river of both narrative and of emotion, really, which again, I didn't expect to find in it. And it was sown by, uh, well, they think it was sown by nuns around the area of Canterbury. And it's also thought that they inserted into it small cameos of life, what their life was like after the invasion, after the Norman conquest. So there's also little small cameos of abuse, of fear, of burning houses, of clutching children's hands, etc., which are, are, are smaller pieces which are inserted into the borders or around the other images. And you say this is probably illicit sewing, the, the women who were sewing it trying to tell their own story within it. Uh, 900 years old, amazing that it has survived, it has survived various attempts to cut it up to use for you know, carnival floats and uh, military wagons, but it survived, and it is still brilliant, most brilliant in colours, and also brilliant as I say in the way that those women use just four simple stitches and only four main colours and the kind of hues that the dyes gave from these colours to then tell this extraordinary story of medieval life, of power, of conquest, and of defeat, um, and it has all the emotions attached to that within it. And what does the what it's made the materials and the stitches and so on, what does that tell us about the social and I kind of I guess also the economic history of that time? Well actually at that time, which is interesting, then the main form of, of court embroidery, church embroidery, was a, a form called Opus Anglicanum, which is a very highly sophisticated form of almost a three-dimensional embroidery using you know, uh, gold work using techniques that meant that you got much more definition in shading, so that really, again, in candlelight, uh, using lots of gold and silver, these things would pick up the light and have the luminosity of faith, really, with what they're after. Now, the biotapsy isn't that. The biotapsy is made in plain linen with woolen um, thread, and they think that probably that was done because the, the, the Bishop Odo who commissioned it um, was um, intent on making it a huge, vast narrative as it was, but it would have been too expensive to have done that in Opus Anglicanum because Opus Anglicanum was the highest form of art at the time and therefore was the most expensive form of art above um, uh, illuminated manuscript. So, probably because of its scale, it was decided to do that, and also maybe because of um, accessibility of materials because England was known for its wool. And so then using wool and thread would have been much easier to, um, a, 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 to basically get the amount of thread that was needed, which was enormous, to create such a work of such size. That is an example of um, the sort of sexual politics, the gender politics of, um, of sewing and cloth and tapestry and so on, in that it was designed by men, but it was sewn by women and nuns, as you said. Um, let's jump forward a few centuries to the 19th century and talk about the singer and his sewing machine, because there's a, you know, there are there are some parallels I think there perhaps. In terms of the thing, I mean, it's very interesting in terms of his life because, of course, we think of the sewing machine as you say as a very demure object, you know, in in a parlour. And of course, Singer, Singer himself was a wanton um, feminizer who then had, you know, numerous illegitimate children and a vast number of affairs and, and you know, lived, you know, had a mistress for years and years with whom he fathered, I think it was 10 children. 
and um, and came from nothing. Um, you know, as a 12 year old, was out there in the wide world trying to find his way without family behind him. And basically then decided to use his technical skills because he'd worked as a laborer, he'd worked in those, and he'd also worked as a, as a traveling uh, theatrical performer at one point. Um, and decided to harness both those things, his manual skills, with his love of performance to create what was going to become one of the incred most incredible conventions of, of the 19th century, the, the sewing machine. And uh, when he created it, he then purposefully made it so that it would be a piece of fine furniture in the drawing room as opposed to being in the servants' quarters because he wanted to price it at a price that was for the middle classes and upper classes and didn't want it to be a cheap thing for the working women, although in fact they then did uh, set up the first ever um, uh, installment scheme for people to be able to buy it um, you know, bit by bit and that allowed a whole lot of, of poorer people to purchase it and with that came a whole kind of explosion of working seamstresses who for the first time could have independence by buying their own machinery and making starting to set up business and he then invented the sewing machine and of course developed a worldwide million millions of pounds worth of business over the next years and he became a very rich man um demonstrated by his funeral which sounded extraordinary because he was in america and then he came to live in britain didn't he and that, that's he where he died he did he died in britain and then i think there were two thousand who came to his funeral he he basically designed his own a funeral uh, a tomb, which was you know four layers of you know extraordinary wood and stone and uh, you know, and ivory etc. and then um, and then had this huge processional mourning for the invention of the sewing machine. So I guess he's part of that whole movement um, and a, a trend, if you like, in terms of making sewing far from classless because people did different types of sewing um depending on which class they were from didn't they and so there, there was some that was for necessity and then the middle classes did things which were quite nice but not certainly luxury rather than needed yes and it is interesting that with the advent of the sewing machine then middle class embroidery became much more frivolous if you like while they had the means to do the, you know plain sewing then that really, once the novelty had worn off, that then became the task of the, the lower orders. And they, they instead, in order to show their class difference, turned to much more decorative embroidery of things that were really unnecessary. You know, so you have all those embroidered pillowcases and um, and, and, and nib wash, you know, nib cloths, you know, to wipe your wipe your nib. And you know, uh, there's wonderful kind of books at that time of you know every woman's book of sewing. Which is filled with kind of knickknacks to make in your idle hours, and uh, and so so it became sewing at home became seen as something that was associated with that kind of frivolity. You you aren't a big fan of those samplers that I think I was probably at the, the, the tail end of making samplers with the letters and so on and the um, the borders, but. That was a big thing, I think, probably in Victorian times, wasn't it? But you talk about that less about talent of the girls who were making it and more actually about a power play. Well, what I'm really talking about is where samplers were used in education, um, not samplers that were made as part of, again, uh, home enjoyment. But there was a whole school of samplers um, that was made in order to keep uh, the education of girls sober, to keep it um, um, and, and restrained. So I talk about the fact that you know the samplers cloth became taut in a frame. You know, it, it became something that was a, a small rectangle of cloth. It had with you know samplers of um, alphabets or numbers, or from schools um, you know and, and schools for um, for poor girls. I had to start off any sewing with their samplers in the dullest of colours. You know, you can get your palaces and your peacocks and your trees that we see in, in other kinds of samplers. You know, they, they, sold very, they had to sew very, very dull samplers. And we're talking about tiny, tiny cross stitch that they had to use. You know, one kind of stitch, very, very small, very meticulous, 
we were basically guaranteed to keep a girl absorbed and smiling for hours and hours upon end. And it was part of making sure that girls were groomed to know their 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 um their place as docile and quiet members of society. Let's talk a little bit about passing things down through the generations because that embroidery is is part of it, but also um textiles in the in the form of patchwork quilts where material is is taken from a previous generation and created in, is made into something new and you have a particular family example of that don't you i do i have Anne jean's quilt i mean the lovely thing about um wood quilting and patchwork is that in in many cultures the sewing together of scraps of cloth particularly cloth that had come from the clothes of family members who had died was seen to be a way of actually bringing their energy to help and support the future generations. So it was a, creating a connection between those generations and, and giving a role still to those that had passed on, which I think is lovely. And we were helping uh, my husband's aunt Jean to clear out a house near here in Scotland. And in the attic in the trunk, we discovered a vast patchwork quilt. Uh, made in kind of very faded apricots and pale pinks and violets and blues. Um, and I thought, gosh, that is so big, I'm going to count, it was made of hexagons. And I thought I'm going to count number 6,000 hexagons in that one quote. And I imagined it was made with a communal act, again, women sitting around together in the afternoon, maybe for somebody who's going to be married, maybe talking about what her life would be like, what their married life had been like. And you feel that quote, is an elderly filled with conversations from the past and you brought it back to our house and although part of it is torn some of it's very warm it's faded then we still use it because it keeps us we feel connected to those past generations but very funnily because we thought it had come through his family that when we asked aunt jean she said oh no no a neighbor had given it to his, her mother and she had no idea where it came from <laughs> so the, the romance of hope that we we can have the sentimentality about oh my goodness we have been thrown by past hands of our own family that was not the case but it doesn't matter because it's still filled with past hands of other people's lives so that's um one of those situations where it's been passed on through generations and that's actually what you've done claire isn't it in, in terms of, of writing this book you've passed it on to your own family you've, you pass it on to the next generation of, of people who love sewing or who are interested uh, in it. I wonder how many similarities, if, if any, you found between a lifetime of sewing and coming to sit down and write this book? Well, very strangely, I thought about this after I finished the book, really, and I thought there were great similarities between how I sew and how I write because the way I sew is usually using a plique, which is where you're making, taking all sorts of different kinds of bits of cloth and creating pictures out of those different kinds of pieces, different textures. And in the way you write the book was the same idea. It was gathering up all these stories from different people, which all had the different kinds of themes and textures within them, and then laying them onto a thing called a book laying them in and then stitching them down. And at times you were just leaving it there as a bold statement. And at other times, as I did with the clique, I would embroider into clique further detail. And sometimes that happens with some of the stories. So some stories have much more detail attached to them because those are the ones that, that uh, um, had, had more behind them to tell. And so that, in a sense, is like the embroidered embellishments on top of the main story. So it actually, I felt afterwards, a very similar process but i hadn't thought about it at the time when i was doing it so often the way we write i love the way that you speak about that and, and the book is so so beautifully written i mean it's it's a perfect companion for a lockdown that's for sure that it's, i mean it's, it's um it really is social history at its best but also it's about that control that we can still have on a, on a micro level even though macro may not not seem that way um, we've almost run out of time and I am going to ask you to do just a, a short reading, if I may. Yeah. Um, but first of all, I'd like to say um, thank you so much to everybody again for listening. Stratford Literary Festival will be back uh, in November. Uh, the 20th, 22nd is going to be the winter weekend as normal. That's all being planned for. 
in the meantime, there's lots more uh, virtual events on the website, so do please um, have a look there, keep checking back, because there's going to be lots of different things. Um, Stratford Literary Festival has gone virtual. Um, so let me just say that this is the book Threads of Life. It's wonderful. Buy it. Love it. I, I've been absolutely entranced by it. So thank you very much for being here. Mm -hmm. If I may, I'd love you to finish uh, with a reading from the very end, actually. I don't think it's a spoiler. Um, it, it won't matter, but I'd, I'd love to, to hear you read it because I found it something so calming and, and full of solace for the moment. I will do. Um, it ends in the way the book starts, actually, just, to, just basically um, uh, talking about sewing itself, what sewing is. And so the ending is, you cut a length of thread, not one end, and pull the other end through the eye of a needle. You take a piece of fabric and you think about what you're going to make, what you're going to say, who it will be for, and what others will be able to read from it. And you consider what patterns and motifs you might use in this embroidery. Will it have a story? Or will its message be told in symbols readable to future generations? Will it hold so in promises of protection, letting from the heart, warning to spirits who might wish harm? You choose your colours with care to convey specific emotions. You look through your collection of adornments, the tiny glittering sequins, the box of beads, the braid of jig jigging pom poms and select all or some to add when the embroidery is complete. Then you push your threaded needle in one side of the cloth and put it out on the other, on and on in rhythmic sewing until you have made something that matters, a thing of beauty and meaning, an embroidery that holds your spirit fast within its thread. Claire Hunter, thank you so much. Thank you for being such a delight and, and for sharing your time with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Julia. I hope we meet in person one day. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye now.